Now, young people, let me say a couple things because I'm going to uh, finish up what I've been doing in regard to the theory of Calvinism this morning, but let me say a couple things to you. Uh, You're going to gain wisdom as we learned last night through the Word of God. And I would really encourage you to not allow your view of the Bible to be clouded or to be colored by a particular theology that forces you into an interpretation and occasionally a misinterpretation of verses that are very, very clear in the Scripture. In other words, don't put on glasses, some sort of theological system glasses. We're talking about the theory of Calvinism. So that would be what I'm aiming at primarily this morning, though others could be mentioned. Don't put on those theological glasses and then view the Bible through those, but rather allow the words of the Bible to speak clearly from the page. That is where we will gain the ultimate wisdom, and this is what we're trying to demonstrate this morning. With that in mind, take your Bible and turn to the third chapter of the Gospel of John, John chapter 3. You're probably thinking, Pastor, I know exactly where you are going, and we will be covering the most famous verse in the Bible briefly this morning, but we're going to look at its context. Another interesting point that I would make is that theological systems that force themselves upon the Bible often will abandon the context, not only the immediate context of the verses that they use as uh, proof texts, but also the extended context. And when you're looking at a passage of scripture, do not just isolate a few verses and say, well, these are my proof texts. Rather, look at the entire context to gain a whole understanding understanding of the complete message. So John chapter 3 in your Bible with me, we will read verses very familiar. One verse, of course, the most familiar verse in all of the Bible. And then we're going to see what God has to say about the matter of Christ's atonement. Christ's atonement. Did the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came to die on the cross, did he die only for a certain small segment of the population of the world Or did he die for all? The question this morning is, is the Calvinistic theory of limited atonement, that Jesus did not die for everyone, but that he only died for a few, the elect, those who are sovereignly chosen by God, is that theory upheld in Scripture? Now, right away, I understand that there is an argument even among Calvinists regarding the concept of limited atonement. The difference between them is the four-point or the five-point Calvinist. And there are some who would like to say, well, Pastor, I hold a moderate form of Calvinism being four-point Calvinism, rejecting the concept of limited atonement. However, the five-point Calvinists, and these are by far in the majority today as far as intellectual scholars within the Calvinistic movement are concerned. The five-point Calvinists view the rejection of the theory of limited atonement as a compromise of the entire Calvinistic system. Some of you are familiar with the name John Piper. John Piper, in his writings, defends the concept that Christ did not die for the whole world, but that he died for only a limited number of people, of individuals, the elect. And he says that any who do not accept that theory have compromised the whole system of Calvinism. But more about that in a moment. I just want to assure you that I am aware that even within the Calvinistic theory, there exists some division regarding this matter. It is, however, to most Calvinists a vital link in a logical chain that begins with what I believe to be a false uh, false assumption. Look at your Bible, John chapter 3, verse number 14. The Bible says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now pause there. This, of course, harkens back to the Old Testament story where the only way for deliverance of the people because of God's judgment upon their rebellion, the only method for deliverance was that Moses fashioned a brazen serpent and he put it upon a pole. That symbol, by the way, today remains in our medical community as a symbol of medicine and healing. Moses fashioned a brazen serpent and he put it upon a pole and he held it up before all the people, all the children of Israel. The plague of God had hit the camp very very definitely, many had died. And Moses' message to the entire camp, to all of Israel, without any exclusion whatsoever, Moses' message was, look upon the serpent and live. He did not limit the offer of life by looking and obedient faith and looking at that serpent that he had fashioned. He did not limit it to only certain within the camp. 
but he said that all of Israel may look and live with no limitation. Pastor Monty did all look upon the serpent. There were doubtless some who did not. The judgment of God burned upon the camp, but there were doubtless those who did. However, the invitation was opened for all because the brazen serpent had been provided by Moses for all. With that background, look at the verse again. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That wilderness serpent, that was a prophecy of the crucifixion of Christ. When he speaks of the Son of Man being lifted up, he is speaking of being lifted up upon a cross. That to look in saving faith upon the cross is the way for spiritual healing. Look and live. We often sing that song. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Whosoever believeth in him. Just as in the days of Israel of old, when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness and cried, Look and live! So any who will look to Christ may receive him as Savior. The provision of Calvary, the provision of the lifting up, the atonement, if you will, is available to all as illustrated from the Old Testament. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, the world, not a limited number of individuals, but the world. You say, Pastor Mahdi, that can't possibly be talking about the whole world. What else could it possibly mean? Our Calvinist friends are forced at this passage, as well as countless others, to take the simple word world, which in and of itself speaks of universality, and change that meaning. Pastor Mahdi, it means the world of the elect. Does the Bible say that or no? The Bible says the whole world. Look at it again. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life, for God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now listen very carefully as I review and connect the dots. The first theory of Calvinism that we addressed was the idea of total depravity, by which they mean total inability. They confound the idea of spiritual deadness and physical deadness and say that because man is dead in trespasses and sins, he cannot, he is unable to respond to the gospel message. Because of this supposed inability, which we demonstrated from the Bible is not true, Adam and Eve were spiritually dead and yet still responded to God, because of this supposed inability, this deadness of all mankind, God must bring to life certain individuals before they can receive Christ as their Savior. That is the theory that an individual is born again or quickened, made alive before he actually exercises faith in Christ. We spoke yesterday of the idea that those who are made alive are considered to be the elect, and that God chooses certain individuals and passes over others, though he gives an invitation to all all to be saved, his invitation is by necessity disingenuous because according to the Calvinistic theory, he already knows who will be saved and he has only quickened or regenerated or made alive certain individuals that are hand-selected, leaving the rest to eternal damnation. That, by the way, indicates that salvation is not conditional upon faith, but rather upon God's choosing one to be saved. Now, what does the Bible say? The Bible says salvation is conditioned upon your faith. That salvation is offered to all the world, as we'll speak of in just a moment, but that you must believe. And if you fail to believe, your lack of belief is the key that will condemn you to an eternity in hell, not the idea that God simply did not choose you. Many Calvinists do say that they reject the concept of a limited atonement. However, leading Calvinists Steele and Thomas, in their book on Calvinism, make this statement, quote, Christ's redeeming work was intended to save the elect only and actually secured salvation for them. His death was a substitutionary endurance of the penalty of sin in the place of certain specified sinners. The gift of faith is infallibly applied by the Spirit to all for whom Christ died, therefore guaranteeing their salvation, but that Christ did not die for all. 
Now, in researching this, I do not merely read books against Calvinism. That would be a shallow approach to any message series. Rather, I read the books written by Calvinists themselves. And while I was perusing this book the other day, I found something interesting on page 65. We're again looking at uh, the book, The Joy of Calvinism. It just happens to be the first, the most recent book on this topic that I have read. Uh, the Joy of Calvinism, which tells most people that God passed over them, did not choose them, and will glorify himself through their burning destruction. I don't understand where that's a joyful message, but I continue. Let me quote on page 65 of his book under the, the title, Only Some and Not All. This is a Calvinist speaking. He says, quote, The Calvinist view does imply that Jesus endured long years of servitude, endless days of imprisonment and torture, hour after hour of unspeakable agony on the cross, separation from the Father, the full torment of hell itself, and finally death and resurrection. Now let's go back to the core of the sentence. The Calvinist view does imply that he did all of this for only the salvation of some people rather than for all. Now does that match what you just read in your Bible? No. For God so loved the world... But he says it's only for some, not for all. And then he clarifies. He says, uh, to put it more formally, Jesus made atonement only for the sins of those who are actually saved. Now, everyone, turn on your mind and think about the next sentence I'm about to read. This is perhaps the most mind-bending sentence that I have ever read in all of the literature that I have consumed in my life. Listen to the following sentence. If Jesus makes atonement for your sins, you are in fact saved. Therefore, if you are not saved, he didn't make atonement for your sins. Let me read that again. It's mind-bending. If Jesus makes atonement for your sins, you are in fact saved. Therefore... If you are not saved, he didn't make atonement for your sins. And I ask you, how do you preach the gospel to unsaved sinners? These theories have a dangerous application. Because if I only believe that Christ died for a handful of people, the supposed elect, if that is my position, then really I am disingenuous to tell any lost person that Jesus Christ died for you. After all, how do I know? Because I cannot tell that you are one of the elect. Let me ask you even a deeper question. How do you know? It is interesting, every Calvinist I've ever met has come to the conclusion that he is part of the elect. My question would be, how do you know? Have you ever seen the list up in heaven? Oh, well, Pastor Marty, I have believed well, wait a minute. You have believed. Doesn't that bring it back to conditional salvation? Follow me very carefully. There can really be no assurance of salvation in Calvinism, but how much more dismal if you come to the understanding or the belief that Jesus only died for a certain few people, how do you know that he died for you? This is mind-bendingly confusing. I want to continue on. The only reason, this author says, that Calvinists insist on limiting the scope of the atonement is in order to ward off anything that would imply a limitation on its power. Now, isn't that strange? We will limit its extent so that we do not limit its power. That makes absolutely no sense. A theology, he continues, certainly can make the atonement universal, but only by making it feeble. Now, no, wait just a minute. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from every sin. His atonement is universal. He died for all and rose again. That means, ladies and gentlemen, that it is not a feeble atonement, but it is powerful and can extend to the sins of the entire world. Our author goes on to say Calvinists insist on an atonement that saves some but not others because they know that the only possible alternative is an atonement that can save no one at all. Wait a minute. In other words, if you don't believe in a limited atonement, you do not believe in an atonement that can save anyone? What possible sense does that make? And is that grounded on one verse of Scripture? 
It not only defies common sense, but it defies the Bible. I continue my quotation. In a word, Calvinism declines to solve the problem of how God's saving love can be personal and extended to everybody, yet nonetheless not all are saved. There is no solution to the problem. It is the contention of this author that God cannot demonstrate love to all. He must demonstrate love only to some. And by demonstrating hatred to others, he is able to demonstrate love to some. In other words, God's love is limited. He cannot personally love every individual as if he were the only individual in the world to love. But rather, God's love is limited. And so to demonstrate his love, he has to show hatred to someone else. Let me use an illustration. How many are familiar with the TV family, the Duggars? Raise your hand. The Duggars. Look at all that. 19 kids and one in the oven. Or 19 kids and counting. I don't know. Something, something like that. The Duggars, they have a whole passel of children. And they're an independent Baptist family, by the way, with an outstanding testimony. The Duggars have a whole bunch of children, 19 right now, and I think one in the oven, I can't even keep track of all of it, but 19 kids. I don't even know how they keep track of all of it. Just the names alone would boggle my mind. 19 kids. But may I tell you something? I don't know the Duggars personally, but they love all of their children. And it is not necessary to demonstrate love to 17 of their children for them to despise two of their children. Does everybody follow me on this? Well, you say, Pastor, of course not. They're they're parents. They can love everyone. They can love them all equally. They can love them all personally. If a family that large can do that on a human level, why cannot God? The fact of the matter is this is exactly what God has done for us. How do our Calvinist friends handle John 3.16? Well, R.C. Sproul, who is a leading contemporary Calvinist, he writes concerning John 3.16, quote, The world for whom Christ died cannot mean the entire human family. It must refer to the universality of the elect. But where is that in the Bible? Do you see when you put on your Calvinist glasses how necessary it becomes to complicate the plain surface teaching of the scripture? John Owens, who was a Calvinist of bygone years, says this, quote, that the world here cannot signify all that ever were or should be is as manifest as if it were written on the beams of the sun. Now that's an interesting Calvinistic decree, but there is nothing in the Bible about that. World means world. Well, he says it's obvious that world can't mean world. How is it obvious when the text never says it? Just another Calvinistic decree. John Piper, who is a very popular Calvinistic writer today and more than a five-point Calvinist in reality, John Piper has simply retranslated John 3.16. John 3.16 in our Bible reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. John Piper has rewritten John 3.16 to say God gave his only begotten Son in order that everyone believing should not perish. The word whosoever is taken out with no justification whatsoever from the biblical text. By the way, young people, be careful of people who have to retranslate the Bible to prove their position. I'd also watch John Piper on some other things. John Piper, though a Baptist, has argued strenuously in favor of infant baptism. He is an amillennialist who does not believe in a literal thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on earth. John Piper believes in replacement theology whereby Israel has no more a hope or for salvation or no part, more part of the plan of God ultimately, but that rather his church has replaced Israel or all Christians in general in God's plan. He refers to his church, Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, he refers to it as the new Israel. John Piper subscribes to preterism, meaning he believes that most of the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled, including the tribulation period. John Piper believes that Satan is presently bound on this earth. In other words, Satan is not active. Let me ask you a question. Have you read the paper lately? If there's no such thing as an active devil today, who is causing all of this mischief? But this is one of the beliefs. Of course, he is only mimicking John Calvin. You say, Pastor Marty, did John Calvin believe some of these things? Yes. Calvin believed in infant baptism for salvation. Oh, Pastor Marty, surely not. 
May I quote for you, John Calvin? I'm just being honest with my quotations. Here's what John Calvin said regarding baptism. Quote, At whatever time we are baptized, we are washed and purified once for the whole life. We must recall our baptism so as to feel certain and secure of the remission of our sins. It wipes and washes away all our defilements. That's John Calvin. That is a direct quote. Ladies and gentlemen, that is baptismal regeneration. If I were to preach that from this pulpit, I would be gently, perhaps not so gently, escorted off the platform. Because we do not believe that baptism can save. Well, Pastor Mahdi, he was just had some carryovers from the Roman Catholic Church. He wasn't aware of biblical baptism. Oh, really? Did you know that in 1537, John Calvin banished all Anabaptists from Geneva? He did not like Anabaptists, Baptistic people who simply believed the Bible. He referred to Baptists as the henchmen of Satan. A little history becomes uncomfortable. Of the Anabaptists, John Calvin wrote, quote, One should not be content with simply killing such people, but should burn them cruelly. 1533 in a letter. Now, history is a stubborn thing. But this man was aware of the truth, but had rejected it in favor of his own system. In fact, he became so virulent in regard to defending his system in Geneva, where he ruled essentially as a dictator, that any who disagreed with him were flogged in punishment, and over 58 were executed by burnings, torture, and beheading. Some who were put into prison for disagreeing with John Calvin chose rather to commit suicide than to face the heinous torture that would be put upon them by Calvin's execution squad. There was a man named Servetus, Michael Servetus. He was an intelligent man. He discovered the pulmonary circulation of the blood. He was an error doctrinally. We would not have agreed with the man's doctrine. But one thing Servetus had right was that he rejected the concept of infant baptism. He wrote more than 30 letters to John Calvin talking about infant baptism. And finally, when Calvin could stand it no more, he had the man arrested. He put him on trial, and for two months, John Calvin acted as chief prosecutor with 38 counts of heresy given against this man, Servetus. At the end of the trial, he was convicted on two counts. One, Unitarianism, which we certainly would reject, and two, he was convicted for rejecting infant baptism, which most, if not all of us in this room, would reject. You say, Pastor, what happened to Michael? Michael was taken into a public square was tied to a stake, wood piled around him. One of his books that he had written was tied to his body, and then a fire was lit in the wood. As the whole city of Geneva watched, this individual was consumed in flames on the word of John Calvin. History is a stubborn thing. Young people, follow me on this. Be careful what you call yourself. I would not want to be affiliated with that name. If I did the same thing today, and I've had a few young people come to me with honest questions. By the way, every young person who's had questions has been honest, has been respectful, has been kind to me. Uh, we've had good discussion. There's been no combative spirit. I so appreciate that. But if I singled out that young person and said, you know, you disagree with me. We will go out here outside of the Crown Center. Someone get a pile of wood or textbooks. <laughs> Let us pile them around his feet, bind him to a stake, and set him on fire because he disagrees with Pastor Monty. <laughs> Do you know what you would say? Pastor Monty, you are deranged. But not only that, you would say you're not a very good Christian. How is it that 500 years can elapse and all of a sudden we lift up this murderous individual and say he was one of the great doctors of the church? I cannot understand it. Well, what does the Bible teach about the matter of Christ's atonement? Very quickly, Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us 
all. If you're taking notes, write the references quickly. John 1, 29. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John 7, 37. If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Any man, water is provided. Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Romans 5, 6. Christ died for the ungodly. Galatians 3, 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith might be given to them that believe. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 6, who gave himself a ransom for all. Are you understanding here the universality of Christ's atonement? 1 Timothy 4.10, we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. In other words, belief is the condition for salvation. Hebrews 2.9, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Do you see the universality? 2 Peter 3 verse 9, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 1 John 2, verse 2, and if you haven't written any down, write this one down for sure. 1 John 2, verse 2, speaking of Jesus, John said, And he, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, writing to Christians, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So, Pastor Monty, what do they do with that verse? They will say... And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world of the elect. That's double talk. It makes no sense. And it adds words to the text of scripture that simply are not there. First John 4.14, 4, John tells us the good news. The good news. The good news of the gospel. That the Father sent the Son to be the savior of the world. On that star-filled night in the mountains and hills overlooking Bethlehem of Judah, there were some shepherds that gathered on the hillside there. Suddenly the angel host appeared to them and said, Behold, we bring you good tidings of great news, which shall be to all people, all people, In other words, that Savior born in Bethlehem's manger, that little baby, God incarnate, was not just born to live a perfect and sinless life and then to die on the cross of Calvary for a select few while God overpassed the rest of the world to be reprobate and condemned to the fires of hell. No, that that little baby brought the good news of salvation to the entire world. And that the gospel is good news, for while we are all lost in sin, the Holy Spirit of God, when Jesus is lifted up, will draw all men unto him. And that every man, woman, and boy and girl hearing the gospel has an opportunity to respond. And God woos, and God courts, and God convicts, and God encourages, and God invites, whosoever will may come. And to one laden down with his sins, it is good news. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he placed no limit, because his atonement is complete and universal for all. Pastor Monty, does that mean that all will be saved? No, 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 certainly not. Only those who believe. But if you die and go to hell, it is not because God predetermined it. It is because you have not believed the gospel.